in the same direction. And the same direction is not just saying we want better schools or we want better outcomes. It is clarity about what does that actually look like, how will we know that students are doing better. Now, in order to do that, the second component of collective impact is key. This is built on a continuous improvement model, and in order to continuously improve, I need to be looking at on a regular basis, monthly at least, what is happening in my classrooms and in my schools with the different initiatives that I'm doing. You need to have data flowing in a way that doesn't just point out things aren't working here or things aren't working there, but more importantly, where are things working? Because there are lots of great classrooms that are taking place. But right now, in the data that you saw, it's all being aggregated up at a district level. And so you lose those bright spots, right? They, they, they get masked in all this other data. We need to get down to the level of data where we can find out what is actually working and where. Because once we figure that out and we understand it, then we can get more of those same practices to take place. Too often in school systems when something is not going well, somebody went off to some conference or somebody heard something and they're like, oh, we're going to buy this new program and this is going to fix all of the woes that we've got. This is not about programs, this is about practices. Where do we see folks that are getting good outcomes with the same types of students, under the same types of conditions that will make you be successful? The third part of this is around continuous communication. As Laura has said, this is a big group of folks. We had almost 1,000 folks that attended in total the four different community meetings. It is, a, and it, they were very racially diverse, which I give you kudos to the, all the folks who went out there and, and, and beat bushes to get people to come. But it is a drop in the bucket in terms of the amount of people that we've got in this community that need to be informed. And when you have, as a community, folks who don't always trust one another, or there are certain communities that have felt like they've been left out of the discussions and stuff, even when you invite them into the discussion in a very honest and genuine way, they still don't trust you, right? And so you need to develop that communication. You need to be able to, to send out things and keep everybody in the loop on a constant basis. And that doesn't mean that you won't screw up and make mistakes, right? The issue is, do we own it? Do we move forward? Do we keep the lines of communication open and moving forward? Uh, in the end, I would say the biggest thing is you need to have a backbone. All of you are busy at work. All of these people are busy with work. You need somebody who owns this, right? You need somebody who wakes up day in and day out, and this is all they think about, is how do I figure out what's working in my school system, how do I define what that is, and how do I get more people all on board? And that is the biggest part of this work.
Um, obviously, this is a business lunch and it's a chamber event, but um, the public meetings, we've had just about 30 to 40 percent teacher turnout to each one of those, and they have definitely voiced a desire to be involved in this process. Uh, so what are the plans to make sure that the voice of the educators are heard during the collective impact process? Well, I, I would approach it two ways. One, uh, you know, there's two target audiences for this answer. One is I've had uh, a number of non-educators say, well, you got to have the teachers involved. you got to have the teachers involved in the solution. And we hear you within the district. Within the district, just going back to a couple of examples I gave earlier, when it came to developing a professional development program on planning lessons and curriculum in the, in the classroom, we, we, got, we called upon our own teachers to create those excellence in teaching models. We also have uh, the, those professional learning communities where we allow opportunities for the teachers to collaborate among themselves at the classroom level, at subject level, to talk among themselves to make a difference so that they're involved in how they can improve the, level, the quality of instruction in the classroom. We also, two other examples, we also have teacher organizations. DEIC is a fancy word, but each campus, the, te the, the teacher peers among themselves elect a campus representative to serve on that committee and meets once a month with, at the district level. So they, they participate in campus improvement plans, district improvement plans, and all the other challenges that the district faces. MISD also participates in a teacher communication program in which it, it allows communication at the district level to teachers on questions that they have, suggestions they have, so there's an open dialogue. So to the non-educators that aren't familiar what we're doing within the district that have said, are the teachers involved in trying to improve uh, academic performance in Midland? Yes, certainly within the district. Now for the teachers, uh, many of which are here, but to the teacher, I'll tell you what I tell them about this collective impact process, about this Educate Texas process. They say, wait a minute, if you're going to seek to improve the quality of education in Midland, we want to be involved. And looking at your leadership committee, there aren't so many teachers on there. you got to do better about it. That's a fair criticism. But in response, I, I try to assure them this way. The leadership committee, at its heart as I understand it, is designed to be, you know, as I said earlier, a cross-section of community leaders, organizations, people that can make a difference with others and represent a point of view. That leadership committee, among other things, one of their primary role would be to identify what this community wants to get behind them on our educational objectives. Those, those, those standards or objectives haven't been set yet, but Chris has given us some examples where other communities have said, okay, we want to concentrate on pre-kindergarten pre readiness, third grade reading, math scores, graduation rates, and post-secondary attainment of a degree or certificate. I think, I tell the teachers, I think that the leadership committee with that cross-section of community members representative can do a fine job of recognizing what they, as a community, those community leaders representing their organizations and points of view can get behind. But when it comes to where I really thought the teachers are going to be plugged in, we're going to put some more on the leadership committee so that they'll be sure represented. In fact, they're going to come from that DEIC group that, are, that they themselves, that organization will elect a member of the elementary school, junior high, and high school campus to serve on that leadership committee. But really where I think they're going to roll up their sleeves and make a real difference is once those leadership, I'm sorry, once leadership committee community goals have been identified, this process has action groups. Action groups that will be allowed to say, okay, you want third grade reading scores to improve? Let's put the teachers on that action group and those teachers can say, okay, here's what I would love to see the students have when they enter my classroom at the start of the day, or at the start of the school year. I would love them to be able to know this, this, and this, and have this support come from these, these ways, these nonprofits, these need to read programs or uh, after school programs. And then once they leave my classroom, if there's some challenges that they have in learning, I would like these groups to do this for these students in these ways, specific solutions based on their specific experiences. And I think there's where the real opportunity 
for the teachers to make a difference in this process is, is in those action groups, once the broad goals have been set and the committee said, yeah, we're behind all those, then we get the real experts involved on how, what they, what this community do can achieve those goals in the classroom. I, I mentioned when uh, I was listening to the feedback um, from the teachers. Teachers usually, um, for two reasons, want to participate. And neither one is a bad reason. One is on offense. They are professionally trained in this, and they know their stuff, right? And so it's good to have their insights and input in. So that's one very good reason. Uh, the second reason is they want to make sure that non-educators are telling them what to do because they have no idea what they're doing. And that's not a bad thing either uh, for them to, to have that pushback. But what I would say is in this process, we are not about going in and telling teachers, you need to change the way you do this or the way you change, you need to change the, the way you teach reading and teach math. What we do want to do is identify who amongst their peers is really doing an outstanding job and getting better results than others and make sure they are able to see that, understand it, and change their practice to it. But then what about everybody else that's out in the community here? This is not just can we help teachers get smarter about their teaching. It's what else can we all do, and the term that is used in the collective impact work is this idea of mutually reinforcing activities. So what is happening in after school programs? What is happening in summer camps? What is happening, happening at home, in the church groups, in the youth groups of churches? How do we make sure that all of those different things are all helping to push in the same way? Forward? And that's what most of this work is going to be around. It is going to be a supplement, an augmenter to the great work that the teachers are already doing. Because the reality is that our kids are coming in way behind. Right? Just giving them the six plus hours in class each day is not enough to catch them up. We need to figure out how do we provide other learning experiences for them, and that is where the community as a whole needs to come and join this work. Okay, well we're already towards the end of it, so um, now you get that one time with what you want to leave everybody with. So as our, our my wrap up question to each one of you, um, what is the single most important thought you want our audience to leave today regarding this initiative? Mark? Sure, I'll lead off. Um, <clears throat> I think some of you have heard an organization referred to today called Midland First. And the title is intended to convey that there are times in our community when we have an issue that is of such import that it has to be the top priority of the community. And so I think this is our issue, and, and I, I know that Laura can speak to that because I believe she's the current chair of, of Midland First. I think they have identified the fact that that is the top priority. And, and in that is woven this idea that you, to some extent, set other issues aside or that you move them down the agenda to some extent. We recognize that our greatest asset is going to be the kids who start pouring out of our schools in the next 15 to 20 years. All of those kids who are going to be the attorneys, uh, the servers in our restaurants, our home health care givers, yes, actually in our homes and in our parents' homes, uh, our accountants where we go to pick up our taxes this time of year each year, those people are going to be filling those roles. And so we need to make sure that they are the best prepared to do that. Um, the other thing that I would add is that uh, those kids, as they come out of school, are going to need our support, our parental involvement. I'm, I'm going to come back to that because I think it's such a critical issue. Uh, in terms of ways that you can engage in this, uh, at all of our rollouts, we offered a piece uh, that was uh, passed out, and we will soon have that up on our website, which is EducateMidland.org. It's very easy to find. We already have people signing up for the newsletter, and we're going to be connecting you with resources to become a part of the solution. So my last uh, comment is this is an all-hands-on-deck initiative, and all hands are all Midlanders. Uh, don't wait for someone to explain to you a way that you can get involved, a custom-designed way. 
look for a way to get involved. Uh, take the initiative. Uh, our schools have systems that are in place that en engage uh, you in a way that makes sure that the kids in school are safe. Uh, they have protocols for managing security, so you're going to have to walk through some of that. Just understand that is to keep our kids safe, but find a way to get engaged. Uh, my final thoughts would be this, is that uh, lest you think that all of those that are so excited about the potential think that it's going to be absolutely smooth sailing, that we're never going to have any bumps in the road or challenges ahead to reach a consensus, please let me assure you that we're not so, we're not under that misconception. If we're truly going to get a cross-section of this community involved with different points of view, differences of opinion, there will be arguments along the way. There will be differences of opinion on how to succeed, on how to implement plans, and what the goals and the plan should be. However, I think that we can, we as middleers can do that. Particularly, I think what's important is that if you look at the motivation of the differences of opinion, and know that that difference of opinion is coming from a standpoint that they're motivated to help kids, then the level of disagreement should be tempered by that knowledge that the person that may, you may be disagreeing with has kids first. And so you should start. The other aspect is to listen. Is to listen to that difference of opinion, that different point of view. Because I promise you, you may not, in, in the end, what I've learned throughout this process is that in the end, you may not agree with everything. But chances are there's something that you can learn from that difference of opinion that will improve the overall outcome. And I'm excited that while I think we can do this, I'm confident that we can do this. And if any community can do it, Midland can do it. But yeah, there will be challenges along the way. But as long as we listen to each other and respect each other's motivation, then we can get it done. The other thing, the last thing is, it will take time. It will take time. I analogize it to the ship. This is a big ship. And it takes a while for the ship to get going in the same, in one direction, it takes a while to pick up speed, but once it starts moving in that direction, it's hard to slow down, and thank goodness. We want the ship moving in the right direction, but you all, all of us have to be patient with the process. If we're going to get everyone involved, everyone's going to have a seat at the table. Everyone's going to be able to be listened to. It takes a while, and just the formulation of the plan, then the implementation takes even longer, and then the success that you see sometimes takes even longer than that most often cases it does. So I ask for your engagement and your patience as we move and get the ship going in the right direction. I guess that my closing thoughts would be um, to give you hope. This can be done. Um, the data slides that you saw earlier, uh, one of the communities that we work very closely with in the Rio Grande Valley, um, nobody would argue the challenges that border communities have. Um, the Rio Grande Valley, which is region one, used to be where you're at right now. They were last in every single one of those four indicators that were up there. Um, by coming together, by being very deliberate, um, they now uh, are on student achievements. Overall, how are we doing? They are fourth from the bottom. So they move from bottom to fourth from the bottom. That in terms of progress, in terms of closing gaps, in terms of college readiness, they are number one in two of those categories in the entire state, and they are number three in the entire state. That came from people putting aside their thoughts, their plans, and working together. That has now transformed the Valley community. For those of you that go down the valley, you either go to the island or whatever, you will see a complete transformation of the economy in the Rio Grande Valley. It has made a, such a significant difference bringing the community together around the different outcomes. There is a new university, there's a new medical school, SpaceX, all of these things that were nowhere even dreamed of five years ago. And the economy there has completely Transform. They still have a long ways to go. They are not resting on their laurels. And they are using this process across four counties and 39 different school districts 
to all get better together. When they would work on things, it was always McAllen versus Harlingen versus Brownsville, and the little communities didn't even count because they were too small, right? But anytime anybody that is not from that part of the state went down there, they didn't say I was going down to Brownsville, they didn't say I was going down to McAllen, they said I was going down to Valley. Everybody considered them one region. They just didn't act as a region. They didn't act as one. They are now beginning to do that, and they are seeing the progress that has been made in the dividends. We have seen transitions in leadership, which always has the potential to derail any major initiative. That has not derailed it. New people have come in, have understood the process, and have continued to move the work forward and to accelerate it. But it took them all sitting at the table together, being very transparent about what they did well, and when they weren't up to, to putting things out there and getting the results that they said they were to, they were very transparent about that and took the blank and said, hey, it's on me. We didn't make it to the goals that we wanted because my district or my community or my organization didn't do what we were supposed to do. That type of conversation did not happen before. But it happens now and it can happen for you. And you can have those same results also. Thank you, Chris, for ending on such hope for all of us, especially as we've seen the information that we have. So I'd like to conclude today and just thank you all so much for the time that you've put in in preparing for this panel and for um, just the truth that you were able to speak from up here and to talk to us and, and just being so transparent about everything. I'd like to thank our sponsors today and thank all of you all who have taken a break from your business day to come and be a part of this process. And I hope you realize that our state of education this year is not just a, a meeting that we brought everybody together because it's a member benefit. Today it's different. Today it's about a choice. Every one of you will walk out of here with a choice. You can either put your head down and be depressed about these numbers and, you know, just happy you don't have kids that are part of this process anymore, or you can choose to be a part of this, to be part of the collective impact process. To know as a business community that we talk about Midland being a great place of, of innovation and entrepreneurialism, but the foundation of that is opportunity, and the foundation of opportunity is education. So please be part of this process. We put up some information on the screens so that you can go to our website, email us, or text us your information so that we can stay in communication with you and that you can be part of this. So we thank you guys for being here today and look forward to working with you on the collective impact process for public ed education in Midland. Thank you all.